Hi everyone, it's Katie Wiskar back from UBC IM POCUS, and today we're going to be talking about basic valve evaluation. So as we've said before, basic cardiac POCUS encompasses four primary areas, LV function assessment, RV size and function assessment, pericardial effusions, and basic valve evaluation. So today we're focusing on that last point. In this screencast, we're going to start by covering the role of basic POCUS in valve evaluation and what types of questions we can answer at this level. We'll then talk about 2D valve evaluation and what type of gross abnormalities we might look for, and finish by talking about color Doppler and specifically the use of color Doppler to identify severe regurgitation. So this graphic is actually the slogan for our provincial lottery, but I think it's very appropriate here. So this applies to all of POCUS, but valves especially can be a sticky subject. So it's extra important to be aware of your limitations when you're doing these scans. Now to give this talk some context, this is a paper from the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography from 2014, outlining recommendations for the scope of focus cardiac ultrasound. So they make the important point that a thorough valve evaluation is complex and well beyond the scope of basic POCUS. However, they say, and I quote, an appreciation of the role of severe valvular disease in shock and heart failure can undoubtedly be life-saving. So that being said, what does fall within the scope of basic valve evaluation in POCUS? There are two main domains here. The first is two-dimensional evaluation to look for clues of severe valve disease. And the two most common things that we'll look for here are endocarditis, so looking for vegetations, and morphologic clues to severe stenosis. Now, two-dimensional basic POCUS is not a definitive test for these conditions, and many patients will need further comprehensive testing, but POCUS can help adjust our pretest probability at the bedside. The second thing we'll look for from a basic POCUS level is the use of color Doppler to identify severe regurgitation, and specifically aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, and tricuspid regurgitation. So we'll start by talking about some of the pathology that we can screen for with basic 2D or B-mode POCUS. And with these conditions, we're looking for morphologic clues to severe disease, recognizing again that we are not doing a comprehensive valve assessment and that significant findings will require a further detailed evaluation. So the first clinical scenario to talk about here is the patient with suspected endocarditis. So here you're going to look in any and all available views to you to visualize the valves. And what you're looking for is a mobile hyperechoic structure with independent movement that is attached to the valve leaflets. Importantly, the vegetation should live on the low pressure side of the valve. You can think of it as the more hospitable environment for them. So a mitral valve vegetation should live on the atrial side of the valve and an aortic valve vegetation should live on the ventricular side of the valve. A few really important notes here. The first and most important thing to emphasize is that this is not a rule out test. So if you don't see anything on the valve, it does not rule out endocarditis. If you are clinically suspicious, then the patient needs a comprehensive echo, a TTE at least, and sometimes a transesophageal echo. Likewise, even if you do see something on the valve, the patient will almost always require further evaluation with again, a TTE and or a TEE. So really a basic POCA scan might help impact your pretest probability but it's not going to significantly change your diagnostic algorithm in almost all cases. Other things to note are that it's helpful to use color Doppler to look for valvular regurgitation in these cases, as it's very unlikely to have endocarditis in the absence of any regurgitation. Like in all POCUS, it's important to be aware of limitations and things that can trick you. So there are a number of things that can mimic vegetations. The most common one is thrombus, which also appears echocardiographically as a mobile hyperechoic density. So clinical context is often key to distinguishing these two pathologies. Other potential mimics are ruptured pap muscles or flail leaflets, embryonic remnants, calcification, or artifact. And finally, a super important point to stress here, mechanical and bioprosthetic valves are a whole other ball of wax and are best left to the true experts experienced full-time sonographers and echo certified cardiologists. Here we have an example in a sub xiphoid view where we see a mobile hyperechoic density attached to the tricuspid valve. And note that the vegetation seems to live on the atrial side of the valve and flings into the ventricle as the valve opens. So this is a video showing an endocarditis mimic, a large right atrial thrombus. And notice that the density doesn't appear to be actually attached to the valve leaflets in contrast to the previous clip. So this is a time-lapse video showing the progression of the thrombus on presentation compared to after administration of TPA. 
and you can visually see the thrombus shrink, which is pretty cool stuff. This is another endocarditis mimic. Note here that the hyperdensity seems to be attached to the interatrial septum rather than the valve. So this was an intracardiac tumor, a lipoma. And one last mimic here. So here you can see an echogenic linear structure in the left atrium and ventricle. However, it doesn't appear to move with the rest of the cardiac structures. And I can say that it wasn't visible in any other view. So this is an example of artifact. All right, the next thing we'll talk about in terms of two-dimensional valve evaluation is a screening exam for severe stenosis. So this is especially useful in the context of a patient with a new systolic murmur, for example, if you're worrying about severe aortic stenosis and its hemodynamic consequences. In terms of how we do this, we're obviously going to want to use whatever views give us a good look at the valves in question. And in terms of what we're looking for, a stenotic valve is going to look bright, so hyperechoic, and thickened with minimal movement and opening of the leaflets. Now, from a basic POCUS perspective, the most useful thing in this setting is actually a normal exam in the context of a systolic murmur, as this is excellent for ruling out severe stenosis. So if you see thin, pliable valve leaflets with good opening in a patient with a systolic murmur, you can be very reassured that the murmur is not from severe aortic stenosis. If you do see abnormal findings in contrast, so thickened, restricted, hyperechoic leaflets, then this requires further evaluation with Doppler ultrasound, as 2D findings alone can't reliably distinguish between sclerosis and stenosis. So for those who are familiar with Doppler ultrasound and want to learn more about this skill, there's a short screencast on distinguishing aortic sclerosis versus stenosis on the UBC IM POCUS site. Other non-specific things that you might note that would be supportive of severe stenosis would include things like left ventricular hypertrophy for aortic stenosis or left atrial enlargement for mitral stenosis. Here we just have an example of a normal parasternal long axis clip just to highlight those thin pliable aortic valve leaflets that are opening widely in systole. And here in contrast, we can see a parasternal long axis view where the aortic valve leaflets are hyperechoic, thickened, and barely mobile. This is not normal, and if this were a new finding, would definitely warrant more advanced imaging to quantify the severity of the restriction. A parasternal short axis view can be a good view to note restricted opening of the aortic valve if you have a nice definition. And here we have a parasternal short axis view demonstrating the appearance of a bicuspid aortic valve, just as an example of variant anatomy. Here again, we're back to our normal parasternal long view, this time to focus your attention on the mitral valve. And note again, thin pliable leaflets that are opening nicely. In contrast, we see in this clip, although the gain is a bit dark, hyperechoic thickened mitral leaflets with really minimal opening, concerning for mitral stenosis. Okay, moving on from two-dimensional valve assessment, the next part of a basic valve assessment involves the use of color Doppler. So color Doppler uses a color map to display movement of a reflector, in this case, red blood cells, in relation to the stationary probe. By convention, red indicates blood flowing towards the probe, and blue indicates blood flowing away from the probe. If you want more details about Doppler in general and color Doppler, I recommend heading to the screencast on principles of Doppler ultrasound on the UBC IM POCUS page. The first sections of that screencast cover general Doppler principles and color Doppler specifically. Now, generally the color presets on your machine are pretty good and I find I don't have to play with them too much in the cardiac setting, but you can adjust your Nyquist limit and your PRF as well as your gain. Note that in the heart, we want a high Nyquist limit as we're interested in high velocity blood flow. In terms of what pathologies we're looking for with color Doppler, from a basic POCUS level, we're gonna be looking at valvular regurgitation and specifically for severe regurgitation. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, severe acute regurgitation can be life-threatening. So this is an important thing to rule out in the patient with hypotension NYD or the patient who presents with a suspicious clinical context. Secondly, although severe stenosis can certainly also have devastating hemodynamic consequences, as we said, we need more advanced techniques, so spectral Doppler, to identify and quantify severe stenosis. Severe regurgitation, on the other hand, can be appreciated qualitatively using color Doppler at a basic POCUS level. So we're going to be less fussed at this stage about detecting mild regurgitation or about differentiating mild versus moderate regurg. Really, it's all about identifying severe pathology. So a quick word here about aliasing. 
So aliasing is what happens when the velocity of blood being measured exceeds the Nyquist limit. Again, for more on Doppler, see the principles of Doppler screencast. With color Doppler, aliasing is represented by multicolored blue, red, yellow, white flow, and is actually a useful thing to look for as it represents high velocity turbulent blood flow, which is often present with severe valvular disease. Here we see an example of aliasing through a stenotic mitral valve as this multicolored jet of high velocity turbulent blood makes its way through a restricted opening. We'll briefly talk about each severe regurgitant lesion that we care about. So first, severe mitral regurgitation. To identify this, we'll use a peristernal long axis or an apical four-chamber view. Keeping in mind that a peristernal long view will tend to underestimate MR severity as the regurgitant jet isn't parallel to our line of interrogation. And again, for more, see the Doppler screencast. There are two questions that we can ask ourselves to qualitatively identify severe mitral regurgitation. Firstly, does the regurgitant jet hit the back wall of the left atrium? If so, the MR is considered severe. And secondly, does the regurgitant jet occupy more than 50% of the left atrium? Again, if so, the MR is considered severe. Now there are a few pitfalls to be aware of with this type of qualitative valve assessment. Eccentric jets can be challenging and we'll talk about them in just a second. One of the most frequent errors made by beginners is incorrect sizing or placement of the color box. Now, because we assess regurgitation severity by assessing how much of the left atrium the jet fills and whether or not the jet hits the back wall, it's imperative that we actually see the whole of the left atrium. So many people make the mistake of making the color box too small, allowing for incomplete assessment of the regurgitant jet. So the general rule is that we want our color box to capture the valve itself, as well as the entire receiving chamber of interest. So in this case, the left atrium. Next thing is you want to make every effort to capture the maximal regurgitant jet. So this means looking in multiple views if available and making small movements like fanning or rotating with your color box on. And finally, note that the patient's hemodynamics will affect severity of the regurgitant lesion. A quick interlude here to talk about eccentric jets. So most regurgitant jets that we see, especially MR, are central. So eccentric means that the jet is not central. It is directed off to one side or to the other. And there are a couple important things to note about eccentric jets. Firstly, they have diagnostic implications. So they imply pathology of the valve leaflets themselves, as opposed to the much more common secondary central MR that is due to a dilated mitral annulus in heart failure. Secondly, they will be underestimated both qualitatively and quantitatively, in part due to something called the Coanda effect, which we'll explain on the next slide. The bottom line here is just to be careful with eccentric jets. Firstly, be wary of calling something an eccentric jet when it may just be that your view or angle isn't quite lined up perfectly. Because eccentric jets have diagnostic implications, as we said, we want to try to confirm in several views that the jet is truly eccentric. And secondly, be aware with these types of jets that you'll likely underestimate their severity when you look at them with color Doppler. To explain a bit further, without delving too much into the physics, the Kawanda effect is essentially the tendency of a fluid jet to stay attached to a convex surface. So what this means for our purposes is that an eccentric regurgitant jet will hug the wall of the atrium. It will entrain red blood cells from only one side of the jet, as opposed to both sides as seen in the top left illustration, making the jet itself appear smaller. So let's look at some examples. Here we have an apical four-chamber view demonstrating mild mitral regurgitation, that small central blue jet that we see expelled into the left atrium during systole. Here we have a peristernal long axis view where we have severe MR, and you'll note the huge jet of blue and alias flow that almost fills the whole left atrium and clearly hits the back wall. And it can be helpful as you're learning to freeze your clips and scroll through them to try to identify the regurgitant jet as I've done here. So again, you can see this whole blue aliased area is the area of the regurgitant MR jet. Here we have an example of eccentric MR in an apical four chamber view, and it's that small blue jet running down the interatrial septum. Because of its eccentric nature, we're likely significantly underestimating the severity of this jet with color. All right, the next lesion to talk about is aortic regurgitation. So here we're gonna look primarily in a peristernal long or apical five chamber view. And because the valve is a more superficial structure in a peristernal long axis view, it tends to be better for AR 
even though we recognize that it's not optimal given that the angle of insonation isn't parallel to the regurgitant jet. To qualitatively assess severe AR, we're going to look to see how much of the LVOT the regurgitant jet occupies. So jets that occupy over 65% are considered severe. And note that while there are many quantitative parameters that involve actually measuring the jet width or the neck of the jet or calculating the regurgitant volume, at a basic POCUS level, we're just going to estimate this using the eyeball method. In terms of pitfalls, these are going to be very similar to MR. You want to make sure your color box is appropriately sized, your angles are optimized, and be wary of undercalling eccentric jets. Again here, AR will be affected by hemodynamics and particularly the systemic vascular resistance. So if you have a patient with AR, placing them on a phenylephrine drip, for example, is really not a great call as this will increase the severity of their regurgitant lesion. Here we have an example of mild aortic regurgitation seen in a peristernal long axis view. And you can see that thin little blue jet in diastole in the LVOT. And once again, as you're starting out, slowing down your clip or freezing and scrolling to identify the regurgitant jet can be quite helpful as I've done here. This slide is an example of severe aortic regurgitation, again in a peristernal long axis view. And it can be hard to see, especially in tachycardic patients when there's so much high velocity flow. So once again, try the trick of slowing down or freezing and scrolling through a clip. And here, as I've frozen the clip, you can see this large blue alias jet occupying most of the LVOT consistent with severe aortic regurgitation. Last but not least is severe tricuspid regurgitation. So this one is much less commonly the cause of acute problems like hypotension or dyspnea, but it's a useful thing to look for in patients with right-sided heart disease or pulmonary hypertension, for example. So here we're going to look to evaluate the tricuspid valve in as many views as possible, as the tricuspid valve in particular is quite flimsy, so regurgitant jets can have varying directionality. So we want to examine the tricuspid valve with color in as many views and planes as possible. A parasternal RV inflow view, a parasternal short axis view at the base of the heart, and an apical four-chamber view are all usually good bets. So the questions we're going to ask here to qualitatively assess severe TR are the same as for MR. So firstly, does the TR jet hit the back wall of the right atrium? If so, then TR is considered severe. Secondly, how much of the right atrium does the tricuspid regurgitant jet occupy? Again, if this is more than 50%, then the jet is considered severe. As we said before, TR is not usually the problem in and of itself in the hypotensive patient, for example, but obviously there may be exceptions to this. Our pitfalls here are going to be very familiar and similar to the other regurgitant lesions we've talked about, so eccentric jets, appropriate color box sizing, and making sure to account for hemodynamics. And I'll emphasize once again that with TR, you do want to look in as many views as possible to make sure you're capturing the largest jet, as something that may look only moderate in one view may look severe in another view if your angle of insonation becomes more parallel to the jet flow. Here we have non-severe, likely mild tricuspid regurgitation in an apical four-chamber view. So we can see that little blue jet coming backwards through the tricuspid valve in ventricular systole. Tachycardia can make it harder to see these small regurgitant lesions as you're learning. So once again, I'd encourage you to try to slow down the clip or freeze and scroll. And here we have an example of severe tricuspid regurgitation. So notice that this big blue jet occupies at least 50% of the right atrium. All right, so let's recap the highlights of what we've talked about today. So first and foremost, be aware that valve evaluation is a complex topic and it's easy to go wrong here if you're not aware of common pitfalls and your own limitations as a scanner. There are two primary things we can look for at a basic POCUS level when it comes to valves. The first is using two-dimensional clips to look for clues to severe disease, such as endocarditis or severe stenosis, recognizing that basic POCUS is not a definitive test for these conditions, but it may help adjust your pretest probability. Recall that a normal appearing valve is a very useful finding to help rule out severe stenosis. The second thing we can do here is use color Doppler to identify regurgitant lesions. And at a basic POCUS level, we're gonna be focused on identifying severe regurgitation, specifically AR, MR, and TR. All right, that's everything today. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope this was useful. Be sure to check out ubcimpocus.com for more screencasts like this and follow us on Twitter. Thanks and happy scanning.